Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Banwell Community Church on this Good Friday morning. For anyone who was here last night, the cantata was amazing. We all had a wonderful time. It was really a very meaningful event. We're so happy to see you this morning. Whether you're a visitor or you've been coming here for years, we welcome you as part of the family. Now, if you're a visitor, you will receive a gift bag out in the lobby. So remember to fill out your Connect Connect cards. Um, on this sunny morning, we gather here at Banwell Church to commemorate the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, first of all, uh, Little Lambs and the Nursery is in operation this morning, but the older children will remain in the service today. Um, a reminder about the newcomer's lunch um, following the service on April 14th. Um, for all those who are new to Banwell, you can sign up at the Welcome Center or online. Um, the ladies event, Saturday, April 20th at 1130. The outreach event to Downtown Mission on Saturday, April 27th. And you'll want to speak to Eric Alfaro to donate items or get involved. Uh, Easter Sunday, you might want to come a little early because we're expecting a big crowd. And we'll have some Easter trivia that you can take part in before the service starts. And of course, Easter Sunday is the day when in Matthew it said, when the centurion and those with him were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. So you won't want to miss that service. Let us pray. Dear God, we remember today the pain and the suffering of the cross and all that Jesus was willing to endure so we could be set free. He paid the price, such a great sacrifice, to offer us the gift of eternal life. Help us never to take for granted this huge gift of love on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, that by your wounds we were healed. Thank you that because of your huge sacrifice we can live free. Thank you that sin and death have been conquered and that your power is everlasting. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. Let's stand together and sing This Is Amazing Grace.
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King.
Lord, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to praise your name. Thank you for that cross, Lord, that wonderful cross. Thank you that we can gather here and we can draw to that cross where you died for us so that we could have eternal life. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much, worship team. What a beautiful set of songs, and I know we have much more to look forward to in this service today. I want to thank you all for coming here this morning. For those who are new to Banwell, a very warm Banwell Community Church welcome to you. It's so good to see you all here this morning on this Good Friday. Now, as I was thinking about this sermon for this week, I I thought back to my childhood and and a thing that we often say when things don't go the way that we had hoped they would. Uh, maybe our, our little brother gets that extra scoop of ice cream on their cone that we didn't get. Or we're in class and the kid who didn't help out with the group assignment gets all the credit for it. Or maybe when we're a bit older and we're in the workplace and that uh, coworker that did less work than you did gets that promotion. Or maybe you find yourself in court being accused of something and it doesn't go as you had planned. We often say in those moments, it's not fair. It's not fair. Whether we're a child or whether we're an adult, adult, we have this sense of justice, don't we? We all have a sense of what's fair and what should be equitable, what is right, and what is just. And when it doesn't happen according to how we see it, we cry out with those words, whether we're three years old or 95 years old, it's not fair. And we often come back to those words that maybe our our mother or father told us when we said that to them, and they said to us, life's not fair, right? We've all been there. We've heard those words before. Now, this weekend, I want to take you on two journeys. Uh, The journey on Sunday will be on the road to Emmaus as Jesus, our risen Lord, encounters two travelers on the way to a town called Emmaus. And I'm looking forward to that journey with you. But before then, we're going to take today to look at a a different journey, a journey that happens a bit before that, the journey of Jesus from his arrest to his crucifixion upon the cross. We're going to journey with Jesus today on that unfair journey, that unjust journey that has justified us all. And so we're going to look to Luke's gospel in chapter 22 and 23, and I want to walk with you through these passages. I'm going to do a lot of scripture reading this morning with you, and if you've got your Bible maybe in front of you, you can flip to Luke's gospel. Uh, It's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, then Luke in chapter 22 and 23, and we're going to start off in verse 63 of Luke chapter 22, and I encourage you to follow along on this journey with Jesus as he goes through the many trials of the night of his arrest. It says in Luke chapter 22, verse 63, the men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? And they said many and other insulting things to him. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the elders of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you the Son of God? He replied, you say that I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Here in this moment, we find Jesus in one of many courts that night. The first court that Jesus finds himself in is the religious court, the court of men like Annas and Caiaphas, the chief priests. These are men with a lot of power over the people. They are men who love to walk around in their fancy robes looking very religious And so Jesus is arrested by the temple guard in that garden of Gethsemane, and he's taken to the home of the high priest. He's there, there he's mocked, he's beaten, he's made fun of. And then at daybreak, the council of the Sanhedrin, many other leaders, religious leaders, come together to begin hurling their accusations at Jesus. Without due process, without legal representation, Jesus stands there alone. 
facing this council of elders and chief priests and teachers of the law, facing their accusations one after the other, hurling insult and accusation at him, trying to interrogate him and incriminate him, trying to condemn him by his own words. Every bit of due process according to God's law is thrown out the window in that moment as they have Jesus standing before their court. Their disdain for Jesus, get this, their disdain for Jesus was greater than their desire to see the law fulfilled and due process honored. They were willing to break God's law to convict God's son. This is the court of religion. These so-called chief priests, Annas and Caiaphas, failed to recognize who stood right there before them. They did not realize that Jesus, the great high priest, was standing there in their presence. The Messiah, the one true and great high priest, was right there in front of them, right before their very eyes. And they still let this miscarriage of justice happen. These so-called chief priests failed to recognize who Jesus was. And in the court of religion... Jesus stood unjustly accused and condemned. We move on to another court, the court of Pontius Pilate. We read on in Luke's gospel in chapter 23 now we go to, chapter 23, verse 1. And it says this, Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate, or Pontius Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted, he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him off to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. You see, Pontius Pilate was a a very interesting character. He was the the governor of Judea, the Roman governor, sent there to represent Caesar in Rome, the emperor in Rome, and the whole Roman Empire. Pontius Pilate was there as the representative of the whole empire, an empire in which Caesar was the key figure. Caesar was a, a man who demanded absolute allegiance to his rule. He was a man who would not only receive taxes from you, but you would be required as a Roman citizen to offer tribute to him, essentially to worship Caesar. Not only that, but you were required to refer to Caesar or the emperor as Lord, Lord of all. This is the kind of rule that the Romans exerted over the Jewish people. Pilate made sure that those who were conquered by Rome, including the Israelites, stayed a conquered people. He was there to crush any rebellion to the empire. That was his job, and that's what he came to do. This representative of Caesar, this so-called Lord of all, stood before the true Lord of all, that is Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Pilate failed to recognize who stood before him, the the true Lord of all, not Caesar, but Jesus Christ, the Lord. He failed in this court to recognize who the true authority was. And so in the court of the Roman Empire, Jesus stood unjustly condemned and accused. This is the second court that Jesus stands before. The third comes next. It says this in verse 8 of chapter 23. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been waiting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. So King Herod, or Herod Antipas, 
was the tetrarch of the region of Galilee, one of four so-called Jewish kings that ruled over the the Israelite people or the Jewish people. He was one of four so-called kings of the Jewish people. He was the king whose father before him, that other Herod, tried to hunt down the Messiah. You remember that interaction with those magi who came from the east to to find the Messiah. And that was Herod, this, this Herod's father. It was that Herod that hunted down those children of Bethlehem and had them killed looking for Messiah. This Herod, Herod Antipas, was the one who, under whom John the Baptist was beheaded. This is a man whom he and his father before him were corrupt men. They were so-called kings of the people of Israel. And he was a so-called king of the the people of Israel because he was not even really a Jew. He, He was mixed birth. And he was intrigued by Jesus. He had heard about the miracles that Jesus did and the claims about Jesus that he was this Messiah who had come. And that certainly would threaten a man who would like to call himself the king of the Jews. He was an insecure man. He was under the boot of the empire. But it's written that day that Herod and Pilate became quickly friends. Their mutual disdain and insecurity about Jesus was kind of a twisted thing that brought them together in a tangled web. And so there's Herod, the so-called king of the Jews, and standing before him is the true Messiah, the true king of God's people. And he failed to recognize the man who stood before him as the eternal king of kings. And so in the court of the kingdom of Israel, Jesus stood unjustly accused and condemned. That's court number three. I want to share with you this morning that there is another court, a court that is perhaps the most unforgiving in the world. It is the court of public opinion or the court of humanity. We read in verse 13, Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who is inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he's done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, it says in verse 18, Away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! This is perhaps the least forgiving of the four courts that we see that day, as Jesus is led on that path from his arrest to his punishment on the cross. To appease the crowd, Pilate would offer them something that was customary during Passover to, to somehow show their, the mercy of the empire and the magnanimity of the emperor in Rome, to, to release a prisoner that was sentenced to death at Passover. And so in this moment, he gives them a choice, Barabbas or Jesus, Barabbas or Jesus, This insurrectionist and known and convicted murderer or Jesus who has no real charge against him. Who will you pick, crowd? Crucify Jesus. Crucify him, they call out. And in this moment, we see in the court of public opinion, Jesus standing unjustly accused and condemned. Even within this crowd of people, we might say, well, These are just those that the the high priest stirred up. But we heard the tune this morning of this. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And it's a question for us. It's a profound question. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And the answer for us in a spiritual sense is yes. You and I were there. And the song goes on to say it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. In that crowd, we can hear our own mocking voice. We can hear our own sin calling out. We can see our own human desire for evil and sinfulness. We can see ourselves in that crowd. Even within that crowd, we can find the disciples of Jesus who had denied and deserted him at that point. 
Jesus is utterly alone in this moment. He has stood before all the courts of worldly power, and he is absolutely alone in this moment. Over the course of these eight hours, as Jesus is going back and forth, he is tried before these different courts some half a dozen times, bouncing back and forth between these different authorities, these courts of worldly power. And by the end of eight hours, he has stood in the court of religion. He has stood in the court of the empire. He stood in the court of the kingdom. He's stood in the court of humanity. And he stands unjustly condemned by all of them. Now, here's the the powerful thing that I realized this week as I was reading this passage and seeing Jesus standing before these courts. At each point, at each of these courts, each one had the ability to say, stop, Jesus is innocent, release him at once. Every single stop along the way, that could have happened. Yet each one passed the buck and shifted the blame to the other, shifted responsibility to the other, In their sin and in their corruption and all of their insecurity, they exposed their corruption. And we see that before humanity, Jesus stood unjustly condemned and accused. Their lack of due process exposed their corruption. Their scheming showed their insecurity. They broke their own laws to accuse, convict, and condemn him. And by the end of eight hours, the end of eight hours, The most innocent man in history was sentenced to death. That's what happened that day. The greatest miscarriage of justice the world would ever know happened. Jesus was led away that day. He was beaten, he was mocked, he was scourged, he was to carry his own cross to the place where they would nail him to it at Calvary. He walked that way of suffering, and he did that so that you and I could be set free. He willingly took punishment on himself that was duly reserved for us. He paid our debt in full. He was accused and abandoned so that you and I could be set free. This is powerful. This is what Jesus has done for us. On his journey to the cross, Jesus endured these trials out of love for you and me. He took all of the injustice of the world on himself so that he could justify you before God. One day, each of us will stand before the judgment seat of our Lord. And you and I have the opportunity in that moment to appeal to a few different things, one of them being our own goodness, You can stand before the Lord and say, well, I was good. You know, I tried to be good 51% of the time. I tried to do enough works. I I went to church this many times. Count it, Lord, you know. Times I read my Bible, all the good works that I did. We can stand in that court and appeal to our good works and find to our own condemnation that they don't add up to salvation. We can appeal to our works and fail in that court. Or we can appeal to the work that Jesus did for you and I on the cross. The work that Jesus did as he exerted every bit of his physical, spiritual, emotional, and mental strength and poured himself out for us as he gave his life on that cross for you and I. We can appeal to our own works or we can appeal to the work of Jesus that he did for you and me as he went to that cross The only works that can save you, let me tell you, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, everyone, the only work that can save you is the work that Jesus has done on your behalf as he went to that cross. And by his injustices, by his wounds, by his mistreatment, he is able to justify you and make you stand before the Lord clothed in his righteousness and not your own self-righteousness. That's what Jesus offers to you and I today. You know, we call it Good Friday. And we may rightly ask, what makes it so good? What's so good about Good Friday when we're talking about all this injustice and all this death and all this this turmoil and pain and suffering? Well, the good thing about Good Friday, what makes it so good is the good news of the gospel. The good news that Jesus has come into our world as God's gift to humanity out of his love. He sent his son Jesus into the world to live a 
perfect life, to never break a law, to live a perfect, sinless, spotless life, the life that all of us humans fail to live. He lived it perfectly to a T. The good news is that he, even though he was faithful and good and pure and perfect, he was condemned by our world and went to that cross and on that cross bore all the iniquity, all the sin on himself. He willingly took that. He took it upon himself so that you could be set free. The punishment that you deserved, he took on himself so that you could be set free in receiving him. It's the good news that not only did Jesus die on the cross, but he raised again from death into life. He redefined death so that we could have hope of this life and for eternity in God's presence. That's what Jesus has given to us. That's why it's Good Friday today. What he did is good. What he's done for you and I is perfect. Now the question for each of us is this, will we receive that or reject that? Each of us has that opportunity in our life to hear this good news of what's offered to us, the the justification that God gives to us. And will will we reject it and go our own way, appeal to our own goodness that always fails? Or will we receive the goodness that Jesus lovingly, graciously offers to you and I as a gift of his grace? Will you receive that in your life today? Will you take that gift and know his justifying power in your life today? Now, in this moment, I want to pray for us. And I can imagine there are some people today that this is encouraging news, but for some of us, we haven't received Jesus yet, and we need to make that decision in our life. Will we receive or will we reject this gift that is given to us? When I stand before that judgment scene, what will I appeal to? My own works, which will fail Or will I appeal to the righteousness of Jesus, who in his injustice has justified us? Folks, I want to pray for us right now. And if you want to just bow your heart and close your eyes with me right now, I want to offer up a prayer. And if you'd like to make this prayer your own, you are welcome to do so. Lord Jesus, as you went to the cross, you did so to bear the sin of the world including mine. You did this so that I could be forgiven and set free. You endured injustice so that I could be justified through you. Today, Lord Jesus, I recognize your great love for me and the grace that was given as you bled upon the cross to forgive me. Today, Jesus, I recognize you as the Lord of my life, the Savior of my soul. Holy Spirit, come and make me a faithful follower now and for eternity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 This morning we have an opportunity to gather around the Lord's table and remember the sacrifice that Jesus has given for us. And I want to invite those who are coming to serve to stand with me here at the front as we prepare to partake in these elements of communion. It says in the scriptures that God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God. I want you to know this morning that Jesus is that one. Him who knew no sin became sin for us. He became sin to the point where he that the father turned his face away from his son. And Jesus said, Father, why have you forsaken me? That happened as Jesus took his, our sin upon himself to set us free. And this morning, this table is open to those who have received that love, who have received that grace, who have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior in life. And so I invite you in this moment to partake in this table in a worthy way to recognize what Jesus has done for us in giving of his body and the shedding of his blood upon that cross for you and for me. As we prepare our hearts, let's take a moment to pray. Father, we thank you for this table. We thank you for the great love that you have for us, the great love that was willing to send your son Jesus to have God come in the flesh and dwell here with us as a servant to lay down his life as a ransom for us, 
to become sin for us that we may become your righteousness. And I do pray today, Father, that you would stir our hearts as we come to this table, that our hearts would be moved by the Lord Jesus to partake of this bread and of this cup that reminds us of his body and blood given and shed for us. Lord, would you come and be present here in this moment with us? As we eat and drink, may we think deeply, love deeply, and know deeply that you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your body that was given for us. As you walked the way of suffering and injustice, your body was beaten and bruised. You were pushed. You were stabbed. You were crucified. The crown of thorns was upon your head and pierced your brow. You sweat and you bled and you died for us in your body. You gave your body for us. And today we partake in this bread as a reminder of your body which was given for us. Thank you, Jesus.
Jesus' body was given for you. Let us eat in remembrance of him. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, it was not fair that you had to die upon that cross. It was not fair that the perfect and sinless Son of God had to bleed and die upon that cross that day. It's not fair, but you chose it. It's not fair that we have forgiveness and freedom and grace and eternal life, yet you give it. We thank you, Jesus, for your blood that was poured out upon that cross. As it trickled down that cross and on that hill of Calvary, it trickled down, touching the lowest parts of who we are to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness. It's not fair, but it is good and gracious and kind and loving, and you did it for us. Bless us today. Amen.
on that cross, Jesus' blood was shed for you and I. Let's drink in remembrance of him. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as you came to this world, you gave your very best, and we gave you our worst. But even in the midst of it, your love and your grace shone through, it broke through all of our brokenness and all of our sin to show the glory of God and the greatness of your grace. Today, Lord, as we partake in of the bread and of the cup, symbols of your body and blood shed for us, I pray, Lord, that you would nourish our souls and re re enliven us to our commitment before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's rise together as we sing this final song. sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. 
If you have received Jesus for the first time today and wondering, what do I do next? The Bible is so clear that we are to repent and be baptized, to turn away from sin, to walk with Christ, and that first step of following him is to be baptized. If that is you, you need to speak to me. I'd love to walk with you on that journey of walking faithfully with our Lord. And for all of us, my hope and prayer for us is that we would walk through today with the full knowledge that Jesus has died for our sins, and through that, we have been graciously set free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Go with his blessing. We'll see you Sunday.